intro to investing. And this is meant to be some of the very basics of investing. So uh, if you're an experienced investor, uh, this may not be as useful to, to you. Um, so before, though, we jump into the investing, I just want to talk about where we are right now. So um, let's talk about current situation. So obviously, a large swath, large swath of the world have shut down. Um, large swaths of this country have shut down, and that um, has some pretty significant consequences. We are already, I believe, in a recession. And while there's a lot of debate on how bad this recession, you know, will be, um, there are definitely um, some significant voices that believe that this will be a pretty um, severe recession. Um, massive unemployment. The last jobs report, I think, said 22 million jobs were lost. To put that in context, I think the, the 23 million was the number of jobs that have been created um, since the last recession ended um, in 2010 um, through the beginning, you know, for the, over the last 12 years, 10 years or so. So that's pretty massive. 22 million jobs lost in one month. And some estimates say that, you know, over 50 million jobs will be lost. Um, and, you know, this is potentially just the, the beginning of things. So um, what do I mean by debt crisis? Well, I mean both kind of a personal debt crisis and also uh, a corporate debt crisis. So many, many companies are highly, highly leveraged, meaning that they have taken out a lot of debt and uh, with so much of the economy being shut down, a lot of companies have seen their, you know, their revenue drop very, very significantly. And so what, what we could see happening is, you know, quite a few companies filing for bankruptcy, defaulting on their debt, and that would have additionally significant impacts on, you know, on the economy, on employment, and also on the stock market. You probably are aware of the $2.2 trillion federal stimulus that went through. And while that will certainly, you know, have some impact, it's still pretty doubtful that that will, you know, that that will really stave off the, the coming recession. And, and once again, this is all speculative, but um, there's a good chance we're going to have a pretty bad recession. So what should you do? So the first thing is don't panic because in times of recession, there's also, you know, great, a great amount of opportunity. Um, and, you know, this is a, meant to be a talk about investing. And we'll talk about why you might want to invest. We'll talk about the importance of investing early. We'll talk about all that. Um, but one thing I just want to share with you is you've probably heard about, you know, the stock market and how volatile it is and how, you know, it dropped you know, quite a bit in February, I think it dropped by 27%. Um, but here is a chart uh, that shows all the, all the major downturns over the last, say, 65 years. And these numbers and these charts are basically the, the same, same thing, just shown differently. But these numbers that you see are the time from the you know, it, from the time it the recession dropped, the recession happened, the stock market dropped, um, for it to for the market to return to its high. So, in other words, uh, if you take the highest point of the market before the stock started dropping, and the time between it hitting bottom and um, the market coming back and the investors who stayed invested being able to recoup their losses, um, what you see here is the time for each recession. And so you can see that the very last recession, if you look at, you know, kind of this 2008 time period, but certainly a long one, it was about six years. Now, this is a nominal number. And what I mean by nominal is that's the time for the market to hit the exact dollar amount. Um, that it was, um, that it was, um, but that, but the actual time is a little bit shorter because you have to take into account dividends. Some stocks actually pay out profits to the owners of those stocks. And so 
if you if you were to reinvest that money, uh, then that time becomes shorter. And so what's not shown here is that if you go all the way back to the Great Recession, um, and you know the huge stock market crash which precipitated that recession, um, that likewise on paper it was 25 years, but once you once you account for dividends and and also deflation, what you find is it, it took about four years. Um, so if you if you were invested in you know 1920 something. Um, you lost 80% of your, your money that you put in the market, but you didn't sell those stocks um, and you had a highly diversified portfolio. Um, within four years, you would have made up those, those losses and kind of be back to where you started. Um, so I only say that to say is that even with volatility, even when you look at kind of worst case scenarios, and I don't think that any of you would really be in a worst case scenario, um, there's still hope. Um, so, but before we jump fully into the investment piece, um, the other thing that I just want to point out is that before you invest, it's really important to do a financial self-assessment. And this is because when you invest in an ideal scenario, you want to put your money in a diversified portfolio um, and you want to leave it there. And um, I'll explain what I mean by diversified portfolio in a little bit, but the important thing is you want to leave it there. You don't want to have to sell your stock at an inopportune time because um, you need money. And what do I mean by that? Well, I just showed you a chart um, and the purpose of that chart was just to show you that if, you, if you're able to leave your money in the market, even if it dips, it eventually goes back up. Um, and so it's important, but if you were to, if you were to sell it, you know, at the bottom, when the stock market is down, then you are going to lose a lot of money. And so one thing that unfortunately happens to people sometimes is if they put all their money in the market and they aren't money managing the rest of their finances, they may have an emergency. Um, they may lose their job, uh, which is happening to a lot of people. And so then they find that, hey, suddenly don't have enough money to pay their rent. They have to sell the stock that they bought. I mean, that they bought previously. Um, and if they have to sell it at a time when the market is down, then they will lose money. Um, and so the key is before you even put money into the market to make sure that you are in a financial place where you will actually be able to, to leave it in there for a while. And so that means it's important to do a financial self-assessment. So what does that mean? For those of you who, you know, who are in the workforce, you wanna make sure that you have, uh, and you have a job. Uh, first of all, you wanna just think about, well, is my job secure? How secure am I in my job? If I got fired tomorrow, what would I have to do? Does that mean that I would, you know, do I have savings? Do I have an emergency fund? Um, do I have, um, yeah, do I just have enough savings in my account to be able to pay my rent for a few months? Um, and if, the, if that is not the case, then the next question is, well, would I be willing to move back home with my parents or, you know, some other relatives? If the answer is, well, if I got fired tomorrow, I would have to take out a loan or, I would have to um, borrow, you know, I, I would have to liquidate all the money I put into the stock market in order to be able to um, just pay my rent, then you may want to consider saving a little bit more in, you know, just a regular savings account, getting an emergency fund with at least a few months before you actually start investing. Now, if you're actually still in school and, um, you know, and, and, you know, the job thing is not as important. You might be able to, you know, go stay with your parents. Um, you know, if, if something were to happen, then, you know, this might be a great time to invest. Um, so just, I would say that's the first step. Um, and then assuming that you are in a good position, you're okay with it, then you can actually invest. So, why do you want to invest? Um, 
Well, here's an example. Um, and I think this was, if you put away, I think this, I want to say this was $500 a month. Um, and here's an example. One is you just put that um, in a high yield savings account that gives you 2%. That's the example on the right. Or you put the same amount um, in the market and you get a 6% return, which is pretty conservative. Um, and you see the difference in the amount of money that you end up with um, over that period of time. And so in one case, you end up with 330. In the other case, you end up with 785,000. And if you're given a choice between you know, having $400,000 more for the same amount of work, you, know, you would want to do that, right? Um, so the other thing I want to mention to you is when you start investing matters a lot. Um, and so here you have the same scenario played out three different ways. In all cases, these people are investing $200 a month. One person starts when they're 25, one person starts when they're 35, and one person starts with the, when they're 45. Um, and as you can see, you know, the person who starts when they're 25, they, you know, have, you know, call, they contribute a total of $96,000, and they end up, even though they only put in $96,000, they end up with over $500,000, whereas you know, the person who starts when they're 35, which is just 10 years, um, you know, later, they actually only end up with about 250,000. So less than half as much, even though there's only, uh, you know, even though there's only a 10 year difference. And the person who starts when they're 45, they only end up with about 100,000 by that same age. So the power of compounding is, is extremely powerful. Uh, if you're wondering why this is, you know, it's really the power of you know, exponential math. And so basically there's something called the rule of 70, um, if you will. And basically what that means is if you take the rate of growth, let's say your, your money was growing at 10% a year, not saying that it will, um, generally, people have much more conservative estimates, more like six to eight percent. But let's just for ease, ease of math, let's say it was growing at 10 percent a year. Well, according to the rule of 70, every seven years, your money is going to double. So it, what that means is that if you end up with, say, a, you know, 42 year investment horizon, um, then if you divide that by um, seven, your money's gonna double six times. So that first thousand dollars you put in, it becomes 2,000, 4,000, 8,000, 16,000, 32,000, 64,000 dollars by the time you retire. And, and that's just the first thousand. And, and so, but if you say wait 10 years, and so instead of 42 years, you only have 32 years for your money to grow, then, you know, it's actually only going to double um, 4.5 times. And so just losing it, one doubling means that instead of that first thousand going to 64,000, it's only going to grow to 34,000. Um, and so time really, really matters. It's, it's actually the, the most important factor. So the sooner you start, the, the better off you are. Um, and here's another way of just showing that. Um, here are two people. Um, one, if you look at Susan, let's just look at the right, the left-hand side, the 8% return column. Susan invests $100 a month for 10 years. She does this from age 25 to 35, and then she stops. She doesn't invest anymore. So she puts in a total of $12,000 over a decade, $100 a month. That $12,000 by the time she retires will grow to $201,000. Um, now let's look at Sam. He invests $100 a month. He does that um, starting at age 35 and he does it um, for 30 years instead of just 10 years. So he invests a total of 36,000 versus Susan's 12,000. 
And yet, even though he is investing three times as much, he is only going to end up with 75% as much. So he only has 100, ends up with 150,000 instead of 200,000. Um, so why is that? Why is that he invested three times as much and still made less? Because he started later. So time is just such an incredible multiplier. And so for those of you on the call, um, it's never too late to get started. Um, if you're in your thirties, you should definitely get started. But if you are in your twenties, if you are you know, even younger than that, this is a phenomenal time to get started. And you, um, and it could serve you really, really well. So actually, before I even go any further, let me pause. Um, does anyone have any questions? And feel free to type them into the box. Hey, Jason, so there's a bunch of questions on the board and you okay. can just open the question box and uh, select a few that Okay. Um, that you would like to start with. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out how to get this view working. My apologies, because I'm seeing, I kind of see the questions, but I can't see them clearly. Um, it's very weird, it's very small. Let's see. So if you, me, if you drag along to the question, along the question bar, I think you can unlock the pane from the control panel by clicking the box in the right, all the way to the right, and it should open up a big old panel of questions for you. Did right, so you get it? Yes, thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Okay. Great. Um, so, one, we have great questions which were asked before. Sorry, I didn't see these sooner. Um, I'm going to read off some of them, and I am um, going to also answer them. So let me just read them. So, how do you start investing if you don't have much money? Phenomenal question. I will answer that in a little bit. Um, but I promise you before this call is over, I will answer it. And I would just say right now, you can get started investing with like a hundred something bucks. Um, and you can probably do it with even less than that if, if you have to. But I know for a fact, you know, for like 140 bucks, you can, you can totally get started. Um, you know, given the current stock market, is this a good time to invest? If so, in what? What is the first thing you should invest in as a young investor, retirement or something else? Um, also a great question. Um, let's see, as an inspiring investor with no experience, what steps do you think I should take to begin in terms of long term and short term? I, I'm not sure if I understand that one. Um, I'll come back. What are my thoughts on Forex? How much do you need to start? Yeah, we've got that again. 401k, IRA. It's a graduate student. Um, how do I start investing? Great. Um, ooh, great one. Should you invest if you're still working to pay off debt? So first of all, thank you all for asking so many questions. This is awesome. Um, so actually, why don't I, since there are so many questions and I actually want to make sure um that I you know I do um answer them let me just start to dive in 
so um, first of all, you know, from general investing, I, I kind of explained why you might want to invest. Um, let's talk about um, what to invest in. Well, actually, let's talk about if you should invest now, and let's talk about then what you should invest in. So let's say that financially you're okay. Um, and this is, a, you know, and this is something you're able to invest right now. If that is the case, then um, should you invest? And my answer would generally be yes. Uh, now, let me explain though. Let me explain that though. Timing the market is really hard. People try to time the market um, and even professionals often mess it up. What do I mean by timing the market? Well, you know that we're going into recession. So you could say, hey, let me wait until, you know, the stock market drops and let me buy stocks when they're cheaper. And, you know, logically that, that seems to make a lot of sense. The problem is it's really hard to do and most people fail when they try to do it. And I certainly tried in the past, failed miserably. Um, I know generally it's just really hard um, to do, but we do know that if you invest in, if you look at the past hundred plus years of the market's history, and we do know that if you invest in a broadly diversified portfolio, and I'll explain what, that, what I mean by that um, in just a minute, and you do, you know, you invest steadily. So what that means is you don't make big bets. You don't say, hey, I'm going to put in a thousand dollars here. Instead, you say, hey, you know what, whatever your financial circumstances are, I'm going to put in 50 bucks a month. I'm going to put in 20 bucks a month. I'm going to put in a thousand bucks a month, whatever is comfortable for you. But if you do that steadily over time, um, you will generally do very well in the market and you will get a solid return. Um, that looks like you know some of the examples that I show. Now, there's no guarantee. Uh, one thing that you know they say in the in the investment industry is past performance is not a predictor of future performance. Uh, but like I said, going off the last hundred years um, and counting, including every single recession from the Great Recession, um, you know, um, Great Depression rather on, um, this has been the case. And so what does diversified portfolio stocks mean? It, you know, it can mean a lot of things. And when I say that, what I really mean is that you have, you don't just buy one stock in one company. You might say, hey, I really like Apple or I really like Google or I really like Zoom or whatever. And you can put all your money in that company, but that's extremely risky, extremely dangerous. If you want to, if you want to lower your risk, then you invest um, a lot less money in a bunch of different um, stocks. And, you know, over time, as you get more money, you get more diversified. You might put a lot of money in different stocks. You might put money in bonds. You might put money in real estate, um, you know, et cetera. And so why is that? Because um, if you have a diverse portfolio, then yeah, some companies might not do well, some stocks might go down, but other stocks will go up. And so even when you look at this recession, the overall market is down, Zoom stock has doubled since last year. Um, and there's, you know, Amazon stock, you know, I haven't looked at it lately, but it's probably gone up. And so when you have a diversified portfolio, you're gonna have some stocks that are gonna go down, but you're gonna have some of those that are also gonna go up and also, if you think about it, the worst thing that for you is when a company goes out of business. If you invest in a company and it goes out of business, then likely you have lost all that money. But if you invest in 500 companies, then the chances are, you know, if you go through a recession, most of the companies that are in your portfolio are still going to go, you know, if you have a diversified portfolio, most of those companies are still going to be in business. If they're still in business, then you still have a chance to make your money back and for that money to grow. Um, and so as an example, um, when I say, you know, invest in the market, you can invest in individual stocks. There's all types of what are called baskets of stocks. So people, different companies put together stocks 
um, that are meant to mirror different parts of the economy. Um, so what do I mean by that? Well, there's some index in, you know, one, one term for these baskets is an index. So there's some, um, you know, there's some indexes that are just technology stocks and they represent, you know, the technology component of our economy or even the global economy. Um, you have some portfolio, you have some stocks that are just real estate um, investments. And so you invest in those, you're purely investing in real estate. Uh, what I generally recommend to intro investors is that they do something that they invest in something that mirrors the broader stock market. So, for instance, you you know the S and P 500 is is an index has been around for I don't know maybe like 50 60 years. It represents you know some of the 500 largest companies um, in the country, and it represents you know all the various um, aspects of the U.S. economy. Um, you can um, you can invest in uh, so Vanguard has um, a basket of stocks. Um, it's called the Vanguard Total Stock Market Index. It has three thousand companies in it, and those three thousand companies are broadly representative of the broader economy. Um, and so you can buy one share of that. And when you buy one share of that for, I think it's 140 or 130, whatever it is today, um, you're getting exposure to over 3,000 companies. Um, and so that's what I mean by a diversified portfolio. Um, so, you know, with that said, you also have a choice. So do you start investing? You can just you can just open up a brokerage account, and we can talk about that in a little bit. Um, and you can buy you know you can buy stocks directly. Um, you can go to a place like Vanguard. You can buy stocks on Vanguard, um, or you can also invest if you have a job that offers a 401k, or you can sign up for an IRA, and you can put money in that, and you can make investments through those vehicles. So what's the difference? Well, <clears throat> yeah. An IRA, a regular IRA, and a 401k have the benefit of being tax deferred. Um, and so what does that mean? It means that the money that you put in there, you don't pay any taxes on it until after you withdraw that money, um, typically in retirement. Um, you can withdraw before, but you don't want to do that because you'll pay penalties and you have to pay taxes on it too. So why is that beneficial? Well, a, you know, taxes are just money that you could have been investing. So let's say, you know, normally what happens is, let's say I make $100,000 a year. Um, and, you know, I pay, let's say I pay 30% in taxes just for round math. That means I have 70,000 left over. And so any dollar that I get back, I've already lost, you know, 30% of that in taxes. If I use a tax deferred account, I don't actually have to pay taxes on that money. So one, I could technically put more money into the account. Um, so let's say, you know, I put, a, you know, let's say I was going to put 700 in, but since I don't have to pay taxes on, you know, that amount of money, I could instead put 800 in or 900 in, uh, however that math works out. So Tax deferred account means that you get to put more money away. That money in turn, you know, you have more money than that's growing for you. We've gone over the exponential effects. So what, the, what does that mean? Well, if that means you can put an extra $100 a month away, it may not seem like a lot, but that extra $100 a month can mean you have several hundred thousand dollars more by the time you get ready to retire. Um, a Roth IRA works the exact opposite. You pay taxes on it up front, but you don't have to pay taxes on it when you take it out. Um, and so, you know, it depends on how you do the math. They can both work. If you find yourself um, where you're not making that much money and you have a really low tax rate, so let's say you're at 15% or 20% all in, um, then the Roth IRA can work really well because, you know, hopefully things go well, you invest your money, your career progresses by the time you take that money out 
you could be paying, you could be more of like a 35%, you know, tax rate. So you, so you do save money, you know, on, on the, on the taxes if you do a Roth IRA. But I think whether you do a Roth IRA, 401k or regular IRA, the big question you want to ask is how soon are you going to need that money? When you put money into a 401k in particular, but I would say even IRA, you basically aren't supposed to take it out. Um, and there can be significant penalties if you take it out. Uh, meaning that like you take that money out of 401k before you retire, you will lose 10%. Um, on the other hand, um, so really when you put that money in the 401k, the best way to think about it is, hey, I'm gonna leave that money in there for a really long time. And so if I don't think I'm gonna need that money, um, and when I say really long time, I mean decades, then the 401k can be a great vehicle because it's tax deferred. And at the very least, you're gonna save money on taxes. Um, additionally, some employers offer matches. And if your employer offers a match and you're able to take advantage of it, you definitely should. Um, why? Because an example of a match is if I, you know, for every, sometimes you have a dollar for dollar match up to a certain percentage. So for every dollar I put in, my employer puts in a dollar and I don't get taxed on that money. Um, initially, that money grows tax free for decades. And so what does that mean? Going back to that example of, you know, yeah, sorry, going back to, yeah, going back to this example, um, Susan was putting away a hundred bucks a month. If her employer was matching, has a match and they match her a hundred bucks a month, then instead of having 200,000 and by the age of 65, she would have 400,000 at the age of 65 for no additional work. She just did what she was doing, but her employer was matching her. And so if your 401k has a match, you should definitely strongly consider um, at least investing up to the match. And what I mean by that is most employers will limit it. So they'll say, hey, well, every dollar you put in will match with a dollar up to the first 5% of your income. So the first $5,000 you put in will match you $5,000. Now, if you put in $6,000, we will match you that. Now, you still might want to put in more depending on how much money you make, but the match is like an automatic 100% return on your investment. So it, it makes sense to do it. Um, let's keep going. Um, so how do you know what stocks to invest in and how many shares? Um, once again, diversify portfolio for someone just beginning, I would recommend investing in a very low cost index fund. Um, and what do I mean by that? Um, going back to that idea that there's these indexes that mirror the market, like the Schwab total market index. Um, or the Vanguard Total Market Index. That's the diversified portfolio of stocks. You just have to buy one share to, you know, you're buying a little piece of, you know, anywhere from 500 to 3,000 companies. Um, when I say low cost, there are investment fees when you buy stocks. You want to keep those really low because they can really cut into your return. Um, and so, you don't really have to make a lot of decisions there. You don't have to figure a lot of stuff out. You don't have to actually pick any stocks. You can just buy a little piece of, of that index. And what I would say is for anyone who is, hasn't started investing is really interested in getting started investing, um, I will leave my email address and you can reach out to me and I would be happy to help you, you know, get started. It's something that I've done with a few other folks um on a, just on a volunteer basis and i'd be happy to take 15 minutes with you and help you also get started um let's see yeah so um is it a good time stock market is a discount i kind of answered this before but i also want to be really clear the market is super volatile right now the economy is not in good shape there is a good chance that the market is going to fall more. There's a very good chance that the market could fall significantly. That still does not mean you should not you know, invest. Like I said, it can be very, very hard to time the market. And um, yeah, it can be very, very hard to time the market. And um, 
I recommend just putting in um, a small amount at a time. By a small amount, I mean whatever is comfortable for you. And so that's just going to vary depending on your financial situation. But don't look at it as I put this money, I put this money in the market at one time. Ideally, you want to invest continuously over time. And so what does that mean? Well, that might mean you can invest 20 bucks a month. That might mean you can invest 50 bucks a month or 100 bucks a month or 1,000 bucks a month or you know 5,000 bucks a month. But whatever is comfortable for you where you can see yourself, if you look at the next year, you can say every month, I feel comfortable based off my financial situation that I could invest this amount. And I would say that is that is a start in terms of depending, determining how much you should actually invest. Um, so books, podcasts, websites. Um, I've always enjoyed, um, you know, some of the stuff on The Motley Fool. Um, I will look and see you know, about some books that, I, you know, books and podcasts and stuff that I could recommend. And I will get back to Holly and, and maybe we can send that out as an email follow-up. Um, see. Oh, and so real estate versus stocks. And so, um, so real estate is definitely can be a very interesting investment. What I would say is real estate is, is kind of tricky. First of all, um, you don't want to invest in real estate until a few things are true. One is you know you're going to be in a place, I would say, for at least five years. Because in real estate, is like stock in that you don't want to have to sell, have to be forced to sell in the down market. Or worse, real estate is more liquid, meaning that stocks you can pretty much sell anytime. You might sell it at loss, but you can always sell a stock and, and, and get some money back as long as the company, underlying company, is still in business. But with real estate, sometimes you can't find a buyer, or sometimes it takes three months, six months for a house to sell. And so um, if you are like young in your career, or you might be moving around a lot, you probably don't want to buy real estate because you could be stuck in a position where you get a job opportunity. This has happened to me, by the way, where you get a job opportunity that's all the way across the country and you can't sell, you know, your house. Now you're forced to rent it out. Um, and trust me, being an absentee landlord, not fun, don't recommend it. Um, or you have to sell at a, at a substantial loss and you lose your down payment um or you do a short sale and it messes up your credit temporarily um and so i i, I think with the real estate it can be a, it can be a great decision but you have to be very very careful with it um and the yeah so and right now what i will say is the jury's still out in terms of what's going to happen to the real estate market banks are cutting back lending they're demand, demanding higher down payments um and um, the other thing that's happening is there's less inventory on the market as well. Um, so far, the prices have kind of held up, but with all these people losing their job, we are going to see it's possible that the prices for um, residential real estate could crash. Now, there's also commercial real estate. So when I say commercial real estate, I'm talking about um, anything from like apartment buildings to storefronts. Um, you know, things like malls, um, things like that. And so um, that market's actually going to crash. So there's probably going to be a lot of great deals there, but you also need a lot more money to get started with commercial real estate. Um, so there could be some awesome deals there. It's possible that the current real estate market may, residential real estate market like houses and apartments, that may crash too. And if that does, then there could certainly be some good deals there. The interest rates are historic lows. I think that's kind of something you have to wait and see and just see if, if the market doesn't indeed crash. Um, let's 
see. One question is, does starting early mean staying and investing in the same things over time? Um, kind of, pretty much. It's kind of a buy and hold strategy. Doesn't mean that you might not make some changes to your portfolio. The thing about it is if, if you buy like an index, for the most part, that stays the same. Um, some stocks may move in, in and out of that um, over time, but you know, it, it, you basically stay in the same you know, index um, over time. So you really don't have to do too much, at least not for like a decade. Uh, now, as you get older um, and you start to approach 40s and 50s, then you might want to make some changes um, and you might want to, for instance, buy more bonds and, and less stocks so that you have less exposure to, to dips. But when you're still, I would say, sub 40 um, and you know, at least 20 years away from retirement, then yeah, your, your portfolio kind of stays pretty much the same. Um, is there a difference in an outcome in investing a small monthly amount versus uh, investing a yearly or biannual amount? Yes. Um, it's much better to do small monthly amounts. Why? Because if you invest a yearly or biannual amount, your returns are going to largely depend on the timing of your investment. And so if you invest, let's say, um, if you go back like, I don't know, six weeks, eight weeks, the market was at its height. If that had been the point where you put all your money in for the year, then your returns for this year just one would be generally not as good. Your returns over time for that amount you invested at that point in time might not be that good versus if you say, hey, I'm doing 100 bucks a month. Well, 100 bucks went in at the height, but then the market dropped from like 3,300. You know, the Dow S&P, which is one of the major indexes, the market dropped from like 3,300 to I think it was 2,300 at one point. Um, and now it's back at 2,800, 2,700 something. And, and so it's going up and down. And so if you're investing a little bit over time throughout the year, you're gonna have all these points. And so while some of them you might buy when it's high, some of them you will also buy when it's lower. Um, and so your chances of getting good returns, I would just say go way, way up. Um, How is investing different from trading? Um, so let me, and this question about Forex, let me just say, I am I know very little about Forex. Um, there's certainly money to be made there. I think that that takes a whole other level of sophistication. Um, and if you're willing to educate yourself on that and, and spend you know, the many hours to learn about it, maybe that could be great. I, I just am not an expert on it. Investing in trading, so when I say investing, um, I'm really talking about long-term investing. You buy the stock and you hold it for a long term, long time. Um, and you're basically depending on the market's growth, which you know historically has been probably about 9% or so. Um, trading is you're making bets. So you're you're basically in, in some ways you're kind of gambling. And so your your goal when you're trading is you try to get in and then you try to get out. And so it's like a game you're playing, you know, buy at the best price possible, sell at the best price possible. Sometimes you're going to win, sometimes you're going to lose. Um, and so trading is, is, is definitely a skill too. And there are big banks that make a lot of money, um, you know, doing it. And they invest a lot of resources to do it. Um, and while it can be profitable, it's also very, very risky. And you can lose a lot of money very, very quickly trading. Um, what's the best way to invest without a credit history? Um, you don't really need a credit history per se to invest. You just, I mean, you will need a social security number um, or the equivalent. Um, so you'll need like identification, but you don't need um, a, a credit history. Um, if you want to buy a house, they're going to check your credit. But investing, yeah, not so much. You just need a, you just need a bank account. Um, let's see. Yeah, so apps like Robinhood and Acorn, you can certainly use those. I've helped some people set up Robinhood accounts because it's free. 
and yeah, you can just invest a little bit, you know, each month. So it works. I mean, with Robinhood, you just have to know what to pick. And so, like I said, you can buy one of those indexes, index funds I mentioned um, on Robinhood. Um, let's see. I'm sorry. I'm just going through questions. It's a question about short-term investments. I'm not sure what exactly is meant by short-term, but I I wouldn't recommend short-term investments because so the short term your investment, the greater your risk is. And so there's a possibility you just lose all that money, or you could be kind of a situation where you have to sell sell at a loss. Um, you can start investing. I mean, I haven't looked at the exact minimum, but you can probably start investing with like 20 bucks a month, 10 bucks a month. Um, and so you'd be surprised at how little it takes to get started. Let's see. In terms of financial managers, um, oh, looks like we're missing people. What do you? Yeah, so going to grad school is tricky. Um, going, you know, investing while you're in grad school is like, hey, if you can do it, great. I understand that that's really challenging. Um, the thing about grad school is, so when I think about grad school, you got to look at that as an investment in and of itself. You are making an investment of time and money into your education. Now, you do have to ask yourself um, if this is a wise investment, if this investment is going to pay off um, what I wanted to, but it is in and of itself an investment. Uh, now, whether you can still invest in the markets, possible. Obviously, there's grad school debt. Um, general rule of thumb with debt is the market typically returns to say six to eight um, percent. Look at the interest rates on your loans, and if the interest rates on your loans are say like three or four percent, it's a no-brainer. You could invest money in the market because you're going to get a higher return. If the interest rates on your loan are like six or seven percent then you might want to pay down, you might want to divert more money towards paying down that debt um, because that's a guaranteed return of six or seven percent that you didn't have to pay an in interest. Okay, I see some questions like gold and silver, what else should you invest in? So there's a ton of assets you can invest in. Like I said, this is investing like 101. Um, you can invest in gold. Um, you can invest in silver. Um, gold has typically been a haven for when things you know, are not going well. And so I don't, I don't personally know the dynamics of the gold market. And I think that that's the thing. If you want to invest in something, you really need to understand the dynamics of that market. If you want to invest in real estate, um, that's kind of a personal decision. But if you want to invest in commercial real estate or just do an investment property, you need to understand the dynamics of the particular real estate market you're investing in. And so when you look at things kind of outside of stocks, stocks are really easy because you can literally just do a dollar cost averaging a little bit at a time and a diversified portfolio is, is really not rocket science. When you start talking about other investments, you can definitely make money on them, but you just have to think really, really carefully. Um, and not just think carefully, you have to do a ton of research. Um, you need to educate yourself. And each different type of investment, like whether we're talking about private equity, whether we're talking about gold, real estate, um, Forex, they have their own rules on market dynamics, on history, and you kind of have to put in a lot of time to understand that. And when I say a lot of time, like that might be 100 hours, that might be 200 hours. You need to invest to study those things. Um, and so that's why I haven't really talked about those because it's not something where I can simply say, hey, do this, do that. Um, one, I don't actually have that knowledge, but two, 
even if I knew what I was doing with those things, you would still have to do a lot of work to determine if the price is right, if you should invest in that, et cetera. Do I recommend using a financial advisor? Um, you know, I have a financial advisor um, and they can be great if you get a good one. I would say with the financial advisor, it makes sense if you have a portfolio that's big enough, um, you know, at least a couple hundred thousand um, and um, because they're gonna charge you fees, which is gonna cut into your, your investment portfolio. And so, but if you're, you know, but if you find that you have a lot more money that you want somebody to be managing it, looking after it, et cetera, then it can make sense, but you don't have to have one. Oh, and this is a great question. When are you supposed to pull from the stock market? Um, it depends on what you're, you can invest for goals. So I've been talking about retirement and that's because if you look at the long term, that's when investments really shine, but you can invest over a five-year horizon or a 10-year horizon, you know, et cetera. And you can certainly sell some of your investments at different times to fund, you know, different parts of your life. There's not anything wrong with that as long as you do it thoughtfully. Um, so... What is bad is if you put money into a 401k and then you got to suddenly pull it out because you didn't have enough money elsewhere and now you've gotten hit with a 10% penalty and you've got to pay taxes that, you know, that can just mess things all up. But if you're investing in a general portfolio, and especially if you start early and you're, you find yourself, you're 40 and you have a few million and you say, hey, you know, I really want to buy a house and you sell $50,000 of that stock um to fund your down payment um then that's that's perfectly okay that's that's actually really cool um and then we have a question on socially responsible investing and so i will apologize there are definitely platforms on for that but i'm not super familiar with it um not super familiar with the mechanisms and also the general performance of um, socially responsible investments. Wow. So we are coming up on an hour. Um, I'm happy to spend some extra time because I know there's a few other questions um, left. And you are a great, all a great audience. I don't think I've ever gotten this many questions, um, which is amazing. Um, and so if folks are interested, anyone who's interested, I can answer some additional questions. And, and Holly? Yep. Uh, Holly, are you still there? I am. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so I feel like I've just been talking and talking and talking. Um, and, I am wondering, um, is there any like, is there any reasonable way for our, our last few minutes for mm -hmm. people to be able to ask questions or talk directly in a way yeah. that makes sense? Yeah, so let's do this. Um, so why don't we kind of start fresh with questions um, since Jason is um, graciously giving us a few more minutes and I can hang out as long as um as long as you hang out so how about now if you want to hang around and ask a question you do so by looking at the paint looking at the um looking at your um at your control panel and hitting the hand icon and when we see that your hand is up then we'll take you off mute but do that when you think you have a question that's kind of general that can benefit everyone. And then for those of you who need to run off because you've got class or you need to study or whatever, you're not gonna hurt our feelings. So uh, we were gonna plan on um, wrapping up at seven o'clock. So if you're gonna hang up now, you're not gonna hurt our feelings. We're just gonna hang out and uh, take some questions um, from folks who are willing to talk out loud. How does that sound, Jason? Yeah, that sounds great. And really okay. quickly, for anyone who wants to contact me, my email address is jason at mind, M-I-N-D, blown, B-L-O-W-N, 
labs, L A B S dot com. That's Jason at mind blown labs dot com. Cool. So I'll be your little producer here, Jason, if that's okay. I'll call on some folks. That would be wonderful. Okay, Esther Asunso. Heads up, Esther, I'm about to take you. Well, now you've jumped away from me. Esther Asunso, I am going to take you off view as soon as I can find your name again. Oh, hold on, let's see. My screen kind of jumped as soon as I said that. How about... Actually, Esther, I'll come back to you. Um, let's start with uh, Gregory Damas. So Gregory, oh shoot. <laughs> I keep actually, I actually hung up on you, Gregory. So ask your question again or raise your hand again. All right, um, Jim Cunningham. All right, Jim Cunningham, can you hear us? Hey, Jim, can you hear us? All right, Joan, put you back on mute. Gregory Damas, can you hear us? Yes, ma'am, I can hear you. All right, all right, you're up. Go ahead, sir. All right, sounds good. I was just, um, I appreciate you for the presentation, uh, Mr. Young. This is definitely very helpful. Um, I just had a question. Um, just, I just wanted to know like a little bit more about like your introduction into um, just like investing um and like was there anything that you kind of like wish that you um knew starting out and then sorry and then the, the other thing was that earlier you mentioned like you wouldn't recommend like becoming like a landlord which i thought was very interesting like or like owning like like yeah essentially that so could you just touch on like why you felt that felt strongly about that yeah so the one thing i would share about um, my background so i'm uh, quite a bit older than some of the folks on the call. Um, and so things have just gotten way, way easier. When I was younger, you needed like a $5,000 minimum to get started with a diversified portfolio if you wanted to buy a mutual fund. Um, and you also, or you could still invest for less, like, but you would have to buy all the individual stocks and pick all the individual stocks. And so now that's simply not the case. Now they've created all these portfolios that are, you know, really already pre-made that, like I said, you can get started for 140 bucks, 100 bucks. And so that's what I wish I had access to when I was younger. And the thing that, you know, I wish I had been able to do would have been to say like, hey, I'm 22. Now I'm just going to put 200 bucks a month away and I'm just going to keep doing this, put that on auto draft and have it come out every month. That you know, I, I would probably have like, you know, a million dollars more in my bank account mm. right now. So um, that's what I wish um, I, you know, could have more easily done. And as far as, you know, being a landlord, I've done that. Um, so if you get a bad tenant, they can cost you a lot of money. Um, depends on which state, depends on the property laws, but it can be very challenging to evict a bad tenant. Um, and it, and if that's the case, you might end up having to pay rent on that thing for three months and you may not never see that money again. Um, and that tenant may damage your property. Um, and so, you know, it's not that being a landlord is terrible. It's just more of like, there's risk to it and it makes, you know, and if you're not ready to spend a lot of time on it and deal with a lot of issues, it just may not be the most worthwhile thing. Now, Airbnb has made things a lot easier and people are Airbnb things off all over the place. But if you look at this recession, it has hit Airbnb or so hard because you have people who own three and four properties. They were Airbnb in them. They were making a lot of money and then travel shut down. Obviously, this is not a regular occurrence, but now those folks are on the hook for all those mortgages, but nobody's traveling. Um, and so the... And that's not to say like that doesn't happen all the time, but I would just say that being a landlord can come with a lot of challenges. And so if you are, you know, a mobile person who's still fairly young and you're moving around for work and stuff like that, I just say it can be it can be a bit of a challenge. Not the end of the world. You can still do it if you want, um, but it can be a bit of a challenge. And I can say that I personally have. Um, 
you know, doing it the not great way, and there's sure, surely better ways to do it. I personally have lost, you know, tens of thousands of dollars um, going that route. So um, I've seen the bad. Um, and as my grandmother, who owned three three houses, you know, once said to me, she said, "Jason, don't ever be a landlord." I should have listened to her. Uh, next one. All right. <laughs> Let's see. Thanks, Gregory. So, all right, Esther's back. So, Esther, since so, I'm going to take you off mute. All right, can you hear us, Esther? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? All right. Yes, go right ahead. Um, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Young, for providing us with such insightful information about investing. I just had a quick question. So, what other platforms do you recommend for us to keep on learning about investing and become better equipped to invest into the market? By platforms, you mean resources, uh, like yeah, things like to resources. read? Or... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'll have to give that some thought. Um, and, and like I said before, what I will do is put together a short list. And then, you know, I, I will ask for your assistance, Holly, in, in sending that out to everybody. Yep, no problem. Okay, I have uh, uh, Selah Moit. I'm taking you off mute. And can you hear us? Well, my question was actually answered earlier. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to go to Gina Williams. Gina, I'm taking you off mute. Can you hear us? Yes. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Go right ahead. Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Young, for talking to us. Uh, my question was in regards to paying taxes on your investments in the stock market. How do you deal with paying taxes in general? Is there something that we should know now just to keep in mind? Yeah, so um, and this is something I meant to research. So if you invest outside of your 401k or outside of IRA, I do believe you would have to pay taxes on dividends. So when you buy stocks and stock and it appreciates, you don't have to pay tax on that until you sell it. And if you hold that stock um, for you know at least a year, and hopefully you're holding it longer, but if you hold it for at least a year, then you actually get preferential tax treatment. So you actually pay lower taxes on it if you happen to sell it um, you know, after a year. Um, but generally, let's say you buy a share of Coca-Cola, Let's say that share, you buy it at 80, share grows to $160. You're not paying any taxes on that until you sell it for $160. Um, so if you don't sell it for 30 years, you don't pay any taxes on that. Um, now, sometimes stocks will issue dividends. Um, and, um, you know, and dividends basically just mean that um, the company had a profitable year and they say, we're going to, give a small percentage of our profit back to our investors. And so for every share you own, they might give you 10 cents or they might give you 20 cents. And so you can you can clearly click the box that says reinvest those dividends. Um, it's possible you might get a small tax bill for the dividends. That's the part I, I would have to look into. Um, but even if so, that tax bill would be, you know, for most folks, it's going to be infinitesimal. Um, and so what I mean by that is that, you know, let's say you invested $5,000 um, and some of your stocks may pay, you know, may pay dividends, but you, you might end up with like a $30 tax bill or a $20 tax bill um, at the end, of, you know, at the end of the year, maybe. So um, now as you, if you're investing for a long time, maybe that starts to add up to more um especially like you know if you hey if you start when you're 22 and maybe when you're 40 you might have a couple million dollars um in in your account and then maybe you start to have bigger dividend checks but that's a great problem to have right all right thank you so um the next question is from gina uh gina williams i'm taking you off mute can you hear us yeah i would Asked the, the question earlier about the. Oh, time. sorry. <laughs> then you're good. Right. <laughs> thank you. Though. Okay. All right. Thank you, Dina. All right. The next question is from Asia. Asia, can you hear us? 
Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yep, go ahead. Hi, Mr. Young. Thank you so much for your time today. My oh, question hi. was just about entrepreneurship and investing on behalf of a business. I know that you're an entrepreneur, so I just wanted to know if you could talk more about some of the challenges that arise um because i'm sure some of us are thinking about starting businesses and some things we should avoid or just some tips that you have in general so you're just saying just generally if you're starting a business um i i want to make sure i understand your question are you saying challenges of starting a business or are you, are or, you, yeah like if it, like how does investment change if you're an entrepreneur and like can you like are you can you invest using money from your business should you invest using money from your business like i just yeah, yeah. so yeah so the, I, I guess what i would say is generally the way i think about it is there's you and then there's the business right and um you have your money and the business has its money now, when you're first starting a business, that line can be kind of blurry because a lot of times you're putting all of your money into the business. But, you know, assuming you're running a business, the business is making money, you should pay yourself a salary, you know, or an income in, in some other way. And then you invest that money on your behalf. Um, you can, you, while you can have the business, business make investments, um, and, and there are circumstances where that can make sense. The investments that the business makes are owned by the business and you may own the business or you could have partners in the business and you, your partners may own part of the business uh, as well, which makes it more complicated. But, you know, I kind of see those things as generally being separate. It took me a while to, to really, really understand that as a business owner, but, um, now you can have your business do things, you know, on your, on your behalf, like make donations, um, you know, because you know if your business is successful, your business will have a bigger, you know, have more capital than you will, you know, probably personally. Um, but I would generally separate those two, and I would have my personal investments, um, which are made from the salary that I take from the business, um, and then there's the business capital, which I use, if I invest that capital, I use it to invest on behalf of the business. Um, and so, yeah, like the business, for instance, could buy a car um, because, you know, you need a company car um, or the business, you know, could even buy like, you know, real estate, right? And that could be like, you know, the business office. And that's, that's a trade-off truthfully before you start getting into that you really have to talk to a tax accountant because um, there's some significant tax implications there. And so you would have to talk to a tax advisor to really kind of figure that out if you start getting more complicated and, and doing things like that. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Asia. All right, the next question is from uh, Tommy. All right, Tommy, can you hear us? All right, I think we might have lost Tommy. Uh, Can I throw anything to the last question? Oh, yeah. What, 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 is if you're completely self-employed and it's only you, you can do a solo 401k, and a solo 401k will allow you to put away up to $56,000 a year in it. Now, this is assuming you have the income, you know, to make that work. But if you do make enough and you have that, the, the benefit of that is the money you put into your 401k is tax deferred. So assuming you have extra income, um, once you start making a certain amount of money, taxes become, they just go up and up and up. And so um, then things like a 401k, which allow you to defer taxes become that much more important. So um, yeah, but that's it. That's it, thank you. Hey, okay, Tommy, are you still there? I am. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I remember you mentioned something about um, Robinhood account. Now, I don't know what that is, but can you explain what that is and what other like platforms are like it where we can get started in just investing? 
Sure. So Robinhood is is just really it's just an app, and they're you know they're really acting as a brokerage, and the benefit of them is it's really easy to use, and it's free, so you don't have to pay any fees to to make the investment. Um, the downside is you have to know what you are investing in. Um, and so it was really easy to set up a Robinhood account and hook it up. Um, like I said, I recommend um, starting off with the Vanguard, you know, total stock index or the Schwab total stock stock index. Um, and you can, if you go on like a Robinhood, you can actually type that in. Um, Vanguard one should come up. Um, and um, you can literally just buy a share or buy two shares, whatever makes sense. But like, um, like I also said, um, um, I left my email address. I think um, Holly will also send out a follow-up email that has my contact info. And if folks need help getting started and getting set up, I would be happy to, to do so. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, Jason, do you want to uh, start to wrap it up or do you want to take yeah. a, a question or more? I'll do one more question and then let's wrap okay. it up. Uh, let me do, uh, let's see, how about Samuel? Uh, hey, Samuel, can you hear us? Hello. Hello. Hey, all right. Hi, we can hear you. You've got the last question. Go for it. Thank you. Um, I was, oh, thank you very much, Mr. Young, for everything you've done and for your time. My question is um, regarding to Robinhood specifically, or I guess any other apps. Um, how well versed should you be about, I guess, companies you're looking into, looking to invest in, um, in terms of like looking into like outside information aside from what Robinhood provides for you, or is information slash um, statistics that's on the app enough to inform you? Um, of whether or not the company is good to invest in? Yeah, so I don't recommend investing in individual companies. If you're gonna invest in individual companies, then there's a lot of research you should do and you should definitely go beyond the app. And you technically should like do many hours of research. Um, I don't recommend that because picking individual stocks is, and being right is really, really hard. Um, um, like I said, I recommend investing in, you know, in, you know, an index fund, essentially. Um, and so those you don't really have to do a lot of research on because the whole point of them is that they um, mirror the market. So you really just have to understand the price, um, get a general understanding of the holdings, and then you, you invest and you just leave it there. Um, and so, um, yeah, but, but, I wouldn't recommend individual stocks. If you do really, really want to do individual stocks, um, how old are you? 19. 19. So, I mean, you're young. If you really want to play with individual stocks, you can. It's really not the recommended way of investing, but if you can. Um, and just realize that it may work out. It may not work out. You have a greater chance of success if you go with a more diversified portfolio and invest in an index fund. Um, if you really wanted to invest in individual stocks and, and, and do it right, then you should technically be doing a lot of research and reading research reports and there's, there's a lot. Um, and that's a, that's a whole other world. Can I ask a quick follow-up question? Mm -hmm. Um, what differentiates different index funds? I see like there's a lot of like Vanguard, blank, 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 a lot of them, like what makes one better than the other? Um, I don't really know that most of them are better than the other. I look at the price, make sure the price is really, really low. So if you look at Vanguard or Schwab, those two are between Schwab. 300 of a percent. Yeah, Schwab, um, I think they're both total market index. Schwab and Vanguard, they're like three between 300 of a percent and um, one, like one tenth of a percent in terms of price. And so with the index fund, what you really want is for it to be really cheap because the whole point of it is it's supposed to mirror the market. So it's not really going to do better than the market. It's just going to do what the market does. And so conceivably, you know, there's not necessarily like a huge amind of difference between, you know, an ind one index fund and the next. 
You just want it to be cheap. Hmm. Thank you. All right, thanks. Thanks, Samuel. Okay, sir. Thank you so much, Jason Young. That was yeah. great. I really appreciate the extra time. I learned a lot. I know everybody else did too. No problem. Thank you all for the great question. This is literally the most questions I've ever got. You all are awesome. <laughs> yeah, this was a lot of fun. So, um, yeah, if you uh, didn't get a chance to ask your question, you can um, email Jason or you can email me at hduke at ronbrown.org and we'll make sure we get some answers for you. And otherwise, I think that's it, Jason. You ready to wrap it up? Yeah. All right. Thank Everybody, you. Thanks for oh, you're welcome. Yeah, thank you. And everybody stay safe out there. Um, keep your social distancing. Um, and I will talk to you all soon. Have a wonderful evening. All right. Bye. Bye.